Since 2021, Brazil's central bank has enjoyed greater autonomy, marking a significant shift in the country's economic governance. This autonomy means that the bank's board of directors is appointed to four-year terms that do not coincide with presidential terms in a move to shield the bank from political interference. However, this increased independence has not come without controversy. Brazil's benchmark interest rates have remained in the double digits for the past two and a half years and have become a hot topic in the country's political landscape. High interest rates are often used to keep inflation in check, but they have also the side effect of slowing economic growth. This trade-off has led to intense debate, with the Lula administration criticizing the central bank's decisions, accusing its chairman, Roberto Campos Neto, who was appointed by far-right former President Jair Bolsonaro, of stifling economic recovery. Others, however, defend the central bank's stance as essential for long-term stability. Now, a new development on the horizon could further insulate the central bank from political pressures, as Congress is analyzing a bill that would grant the central bank budgetary independence. In this week's episode, we will explore what these changes mean for Brazil's economy, the political implications of them, and what we might expect in the near future. My name is Gustavo Ribeiro, Editor-in-Chief of the Brazilian Report, and this is Explaining Brazil. If you like Explaining Brazil, you should subscribe to our website, The Brazilian Report, which is the journalistic engine behind this podcast. Or you can go the extra mile and make a donation to our newsroom, tipping our journalists via our Buy Me A Coffee page. And you can also subscribe to our Buy Me A Coffee fan page, pledging a monthly contribution to our newsroom in exchange for exclusive content that you won't find anywhere else. Our Buy Me A Coffee subscribers are Cristina Viu, Andrei Novoseltsev, Wild Rice, Jas Yara de Oliveira, Carson Allen, Gabriel Luca, Pan Ludwig, Leslie Seal, Mark Hillary, Louise Renz, Erwan Menais, Aaron Berger, Cars Vrieswick, Alistair Townsend, Miller Renacido, Peter Abramson, David Dixon, Jose Ozi Stankovic, Emerging Market Muser, Anna Lund, Peter Suffren, Ederson da Silva, and someone who chose to remain anonymous. And our Buy Me A Coffee members come from all over the world, so please, if we're butchering the pronunciation of your name, please send us an email. If you too believe in the importance of independent journalism, and if you want to hear your name on our podcast, go to buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report and subscribe to one of our membership levels. Click on buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report to find out more. Now, this week, I'm joined by Mário Sérgio Lima, an old friend of this show. Mário Sérgio is a senior Brazil analyst at Madly Global Advisors and also writes from time to time for the Brazilian Report. Mário Sérgio, thanks for joining us again. Hey, thanks, Gustavo. It's always a pleasure. So before we dive into this week's theme, which is the bill to grant financial independence to the central bank, I'd like to discuss the bank's evolving role. Uh, I mean, the current autonomy with directors named to four-year terms with a very high bar for removing them from office was set in 2021. So how was the bank's governance before that? Was it subjective to a degree of political interference to the point where formal guardrails became necessary? Uh, Because President Lula, who is against the current system, always liked to remember that during his previous two terms in office, he bestowed the central bank with the autonomy it needed while keeping the option to change its chairman or other directors at his will. Uh, Gustavo, I would say, I would say that uh, in a system where it should, it, it depends on the president's uh, will uh, to actually grant this sort of independence is a system that's not doing good so uh i don't think that it was a problem in the fernando cardoso fernando Henrique cardoso's years it wasn't a problem with lula's years but it was when dilma was president so uh at some point uh, you need to make the system uh, a little more tight in order for the, the central bank to actually 
uh, having the means and the will to act accordingly to their own uh, economic forecast. I'm not saying that Tombini, Alexandre Tombini, who was the uh, president of the Central Bank when Dilma was was president of Brazil, I'm not Which saying was that during tw 2011 and 2016, yeah, just exactly. for context. Exactly, exactly. For, uh, I'm not saying that he was, uh, by all means, a politically driven uh, figure, but you could clearly see that there was a lot of uh, influence of the government over the board's decision, uh, to the point that uh, the board made uh, some, some uh, mistakes uh, well, when they didn't, uh, they they actually started cutting, easing, uh, and easing the, the rates. Uh, when they, it, they, there there wasn't any room to do so, when you could actually see that there was a fiscal expansion, uh, especially what you, what we would call a para fiscal, which is basically not the government giving out money, but uh, public banks doing so, doing the bidding for the government, which. Uh, expressively low rates uh, to the point that the system became completely uh, dysfunctional. Uh, so, like I said, I, I'm not saying that it was a politically driven central bank, but it, you could clearly see that there was pressures, and the bank could wasn't shielded enough from those pressures. So, uh, I think like a system where you you need to to actually have somebody uh, at the realm of the government uh, allowing you to, to, have, to have independence is a system that doesn't work. So uh, it, the, by virtue of having a, a legal, more than just a, 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 a de facto, a de juice system, I think it, it would really provide them this shield almost to the point that the central bank president shouldn't uh, have any sort of political, uh, uh, they, they shouldn't even be, uh, if they need to rise rate, high rates when you have elections like they did in 2022, they can do so, even to the detriment of the president that put the central bank uh, governor and the board uh, in their place. So it was, a, it was an institutional advance for Brazil by any means. Now, uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, under Roberto Campos Neto, the central bank kept uh, interest rates. Uh, it, it hiked rates from a no time low 2% in March 2021 to, uh, by August 2022, 13.5%. Uh, and I mean, it was an electoral year. Politicians <laughs> hate high borrowing costs, especially in a country that depends on credit so much as Brazil. Um, so do you think it was commendable, this, um, this, this actions by the central bank? And also, I'd like to point out the fact that uh, Roberto Campos Neto has become a highly controversial uh, character in Brazilian politics because he went to vote in 2022 wearing the colors of Jair Bolsonaro, and he has cozied up uh, to conservative uh, presidential hopefuls. So how do you see this? Uh, on one side, we have concrete action that uh, he didn't did the government's bidding to stimulate the economy uh, right before the election, but at the same time, he has... Uh, not been as restrained as one might like from a central banker. I mean, it's, it's a clear situation. On, of course, the best is that they act when they have to act. They they do it without this political interference, and they actually, if they have to, if the right decision is going to be affecting uh, the politician of their choice, uh, but they, if they have to take this decision. I think that's that's uh, basically a, an example of how the system, the new system, uh, is better than the the, the previous. Having said that, uh, it's completely uh, out of out of character for a central bank president to do. I mean, even Tombini that we mentioned, uh, Tombini was never like seen in in those kinds of of rendezvous 
with with the people from from the government. I mean, Campos Neto uh, before the election, he was also in, in the, the barbecue. The people say like the big barbecue of the Centrão with uh, with uh, ministers that are more of a centrist, uh, clientelist ministers, and Tarcísio, one of one of those guys. I mean, he can't have the the, the any type of political uh, ideas that he has. Uh, there are some 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 uh, accusations, allegations, which I don't know if they're true. That he was like pitching to the government some uh, some systems in which the polls would be wrong and Jair Bolsonaro would win. So uh, when you have this kind of uh, doubts over whether the guy is going to act uh, good to do the right thing, even if they, he did. I think it's terrible for the full institution. And uh, Campos Neto, uh, he, he actually, it was a mistake on his behalf. I don't think he's ever going to admit it because he's always going to say, hey, when push comes to show, I actually increase the rates. But uh, there's one on one sentence, uh, sentence that the, the, the Caesar's wife, not only she needs to be honest, but she also needs to look honest. So I think, like, uh, for sure, he hasn't looked honest uh, in that sense. Uh, he has looked at voting in that moment in a very razor-tight and very polarized election, voting in what was like the uniform for the Bolsonaristas. It was uh, so unnecessary. I mean, just... Put up Especially a, because he would remain in office regardless right. of who won, he, right? Put, put a regular white plain white t-shirt and just go vote and and avoid press because you 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 you're not there to make news uh i i don't think that the market that actually like skimmed over this would be would do the same if the guy was voting with uh uh i don't know like a soviet union t-shirt and saying <laughs> uh, with a cuba uh t-shirt and voting for lula so i think it's, it would be just as bad. So uh, unnecessary noise uh, that clearly the guy wasn't careful enough. Now, how about this bill to grant financial independence for the central bank? This is something that the central bank has advocated for. Multiple uh, directors within the bank, both from the left and right, have defended this change. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how it works now and how it would work if this bill passes in Congress and what would be the potential benefits or drawbacks from this change, how it would alter the central bank's ability to function effectively? Well, uh, I have very good uh, people that uh, former central bank board members that, uh, that defend this and they have very solid arguments. You have to consider that the central bank is an aisle of excellence uh, amid the, the public services uh, in Brazil. You have lots of those aisles of excellences, but the central bank is clearly one where those guys, you have like brilliant minds. You have like PhD guys that have like middle to lower level uh, jobs in the central bank. They do it. They love it. They, they know how important it is for Brazil to have a very good central bank. Uh, but as you can imagine, I mean, they don't, they, they, they make some decent salary, but when you compare to what the guys from their same type of expertise would have, would make in going to financial markets, I mean, like sevenfold more so yeah, central banker Roberto Campos Neto has said time and again that uh, the bank is losing its brilliant minds because they're being poached by investment banks and, uh, and, and, and financial it's, markets in general, right? A no brainer. They are great. They are great. They are not only they have like very good uh, academic background, but they are they they know a lot how the system works, how the system functions. So they are an asset to any type of uh, company that poaches them. Uh, and I mean, 
as you can imagine, it becomes, especially in a moment where this, this system is ever evolving and it's becoming, at some point, banks are less of financial institutions and more technological institutions. So you really need to have cutting edge uh, oversight over this. You really have to have uh, you have to have a sturdy central bank that actually can uh, not confront. I mean, confront seems like a, a, you, you're always fighting, but you, 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 you have to face, you have to tackle this challenge. So you need to have very good people, very good uh, people working there. And, if, and you, if it comes to the point that you're like hemorrhaging uh, brains to higher paying jobs, uh it becomes like a, it can really becomes a problem for brazil uh to the point that you you, you the system can become uh dysfunctional so when no, and i mean to your point i'm sorry to interrupt you but to your point um for the past couple of years we have seen uh, go slow operations or walkouts from central bank workers who say that they need to um get better pay that uh, their salaries are losing to inflation and okay. that uh, in order to continue doing their work, they want uh, a, a, a better career path, higher pay, etc. Because, I mean, it's not a matter of them just like, uh, and they, they, you are limited to how much increase you can do because uh, we also have other aisles of excellence, as like I mentioned. When if you start to high rising the, the the salaries here and there, uh, not it's not like you're not just like uh, giving a price to the very good workers, but you're also everybody like the tide increases and even like the lower class workers that are there that have their relevance, but they are not really they're actually gaining on, on the names of the others. Uh, to the point that the system can also become inefficient, like the full and very expensive to maintain. Like the full uh, government operation becomes very uh, hard to maintain. So the idea of, of the bill is actually providing means to the central bank to actually do this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, bidding and to actually retain their talent. Uh, but also not be constrained by the current fiscal constraints that the government as a whole has. So uh, I'm more of I'm a little more partial for the view than against it. But I can understand that there 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 are some some problems that can arise. First of all, the problem that would arise to uh, the full scope of civil servants is because most most other People would also like to have this kind of uh, for uh, budget independence, and it's not. Uh, and, and and there are questions over whether this can be sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think like this is not a, a, an easy discussion. Uh, like I said, I'm more more partial because I actually feel like you you need to retain that talent. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know whether uh, this bill, the bill as it is, is, is sufficient enough uh, to actually do so. So I think it's it's one of those issues where you probably need a a, a, a thorough discussion in Congress, which is something. It's like a, a luxury that we are really not being having in, in several discussions in Congress, which is a. a Anyway, you slice it, probably the worst uh, legislature that we ever had. And I can only tell that it's, it's just better than the next because, I mean, the quality <laughs> of the lawmakers is becoming increasingly. Uh, and this is not a Brazil problem. You can just imagine go to the US, the Congress is completely dysfunctional. You have more people doing for show. Type of, of of politics than actual politics, so it's. Uh, yeah, but my, we we don't bring you in the show for your optimism. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I I I think the bill would. I, I think it would be better for it to pass, but it really needs to to tackle some of the concerns that I mentioned. 
for instance. And, and whether... by the way, the the government is against this bill. So uh, is it because, like you said, it could um, incentivize other careers to seek this That's kind of... Yes. And, and uh, are there other think... reasons for, for the government's being against it? Well, I mean, there's also... there. Uh, there's also a, a, a concern which I don't think is completely unfounded, in which if if the central bank, if you have like no sort of uh, no no, it's like if, if it operates as its own uh, institute, there it could be theoretically more prone to other types of pressure, especially from the private sector. And it's like if it could fail to deliver on its social uh, institutional function, you you could be more prone to this kind of uh, approach. I mean, uh, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I I, I would say that it's a, it's not a unfair to say so. So I think. And like, by the way, the government already thinks that is happening right now, right? Yeah. And there was even yeah. a prosecutor that try to open an investigation saying yeah. that financial markets are tampering with uh, a central bank weekly survey on inflation as expectations as a means to push the benchmark interest rate up. And that brings the other thing that I wanted to talk with you because, uh, I mean, interest rates are always politicized and that's not in Brazil, that's everywhere because it affects access to credit. Uh, it can cool off an economy. And of course, politicians don't want uh, lower GDP growth rates. Uh, but it has become something really divided in among party lines almost, right? So Brazil has this one of the world's highest real interest rates. Uh, and the benchmark rate is right now at 10.5%. The, the the central bank has actually in, in its latest policy meetings s hinted that we may not see not only we may not see cuts in the near future but we could even see hikes in the near future so how do you see that do you do th that environment in which the left uh, and president lula has explicitly called the central bank chairman an enemy of brazil so how do you see this this playing out well, uh, I mean, uh, I have to, 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 to tell that I take part in the focus survey, so I am one of the hundreds of, of people that are uh, surveyed. Uh, and I can tell from my behalf that there was never any sort of uh, interference or any sort of uh, congregation between people to actually try to skew the median uh, of the survey one way or the other. Uh, I think it's a fair criticism in one point. I mean, whether if the central bank needs to be delivering on, on stuff just because of the market expectations, he, and, and like if that becomes uh, not just an input, but the main input on their decision, uh, yes, it, be, it, it, be, it can become like a self a uh, feeding system in which you're just like uh, people are uh, tend to have a negative opinion and you have to deliver on the negative opinion and then it's like a, it, it's it's a self-fulfilling prophecy you know so uh, that that's a fair criticism I think the central bank needs to weigh in on whether for instance the inflation expectations or other expectations are way too polluted to, with noise and with risk premia, uh, and you need to navigate this noise and actually see. Well, I mean, when you look at it, this this is the, this is becoming less of a, a, an indication and more of a, a self fulfilling prophecy. Like I said, so in, in that sense, it's a fair criticism. But uh, I don't think the central bank is, uh, even if there are pressures, the market pressures, which every every type of institution might uh, might fall victim of uh, I, I would say that the central bank tends to be uh, one of the less uh, one of the last uh, lines of defense against it so I wouldn't put this as a main concern 
But I mean, in terms of Lula, there's a there's a, a, a like a, a combination that he needs to take in whether, I mean, it's good political rhetoric to be against not only a guy that, like we mentioned, has been partisan in the past, Roberto Campos Neto. So I mean, like tackle him as a, as a, 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 an opposition for political rhetoric. Okay, just like Bolsonaro did with the Supreme Court, I think it's fair game you do so but it also comes with uh with some negative aspects in which if market starts to price in this kind of institutional dispute uh to the point that people would say hey uh, lula cannot like fully fully interfere with this central bank so as soon as it changes uh the the, the governor he will be able to do so, or whether, I mean, he will be reacting with uh, a more expensive fiscal policy against a more restrictive monetary policy. So it's almost like a, a plane in which one turbine is, is at full power and the other is, is, is slowing down. So it's like the plane's only going to be driving in circles. So uh, if that becomes the case, then you're actually getting, getting the worst scenario so in which mm -hmm. the central bank can cut as you you wish but at the same time you're actually adding noise to the market so in my view uh most of that was political rhetoric one that could be very popular because nobody wants higher rates nobody everybody wants to especially people that are indebted they want to be able to pay their debt so if the interest is up to the moon they won't pay they will be keep in this negative cycle of debt and and, and reducing uh, their own consumption which by all means can reduce job the worse in job market moving ahead so nobody likes this but mm -hmm. so it's, it's really like a a a a, 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 a balance balancing act by the president in which okay you have a, a political rhetoric, but you need to show that when push comes to shove, uh, not only the guys that are there, but the guys that you will be nominating will be able to actually do the, the technical job like it needs to be done. Uh, and also, of course, you need to be on the lookout of whether there's uh, unbalanced pressure from the financial market over the decisions to the point that actually they are deciding uh, on noise rather than on sub substance. Now, you talk about noise and expectations. And I mean, one thing that added a lot of noise um, is the expectations on, our, uh, on what the central bank is going to look like next year when its nine seat board of governors is going to be uh, dominated by Lula appointed governors. And I mean, I remember that in May, the central bank um, decided to slow down the pace of monetary easing. It was cutting half percentage point by half percentage point, And then it decided to cut uh, a quarter of a percent percentage point. And what raised eyebrows uh, in the markets was the fact that the decision was split between the five vote majority from central bank board members that were appointed by former president Jair Bolsonaro and for the four vote minority was of governors named by the current Lula administration. Uh, all of those four people minority voted for a half percentage cut, uh, so a, a half tier cut. And I mean, even if unintended, the split was treated as being political, right? And it yeah. increases uncertainty around the future of Brazil's monetary policy, because like I said, next year, seven of the nine board members will be Lula appointed. Um, so many uh, are expecting the bank to be far more dovish on inflation than it has been. Yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, looking at this in, as a technical perspective, I mean, there's no problem in being dovish leaning or hawkish leaning uh if you're actually you're getting the same input the same data input and deciding technically 
on what's the best move when you have this set, set of data. So I think if you're data dependent, it doesn't matter if you sway one side or the other, because when, when you the have The answer is gonna be clear, right? Yes, the answer is gonna be clear, or at least you will be, you may, if you, if you were on one side, you can just like review this as a, with, in the face of new, new information. The problem with the split was clear. Uh, well, like you mentioned, it was, it really seemed like it could be politically motivated uh, ever since that decision. I have spoken with board members from both sides of the, the divide. Uh, and I can tell that they learned a lesson in terms of the importance of a cohesive decision in this board. So the importance of actually making not only the decision as unanimous, but the 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 there's a there's a cohesion in terms of how they're seeing the the this the, the scenario because give or take you mean a, a dovish guy is guy that's probably gonna weigh some 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 data in one direction and a hawkish guy will weigh the same data and to another direction but at the same time the data is the same so mm -hmm. that's why I wouldn't say it's bad to have this kind of split. That happens any central bank in the world. The problem is the way that it was that it, the split happened, it created this, this kind of uh, uh, unnecessary noise. And I would say that in terms of central banking, there is a saying that a credit bid is an asset that's costly to obtain, but very easy to lose. So, and by the way, the, the, the central bank started to issue only unanimous decisions after all the noise exactly. that it has, right? Exactly. Uh, and, 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 I don't, don't, and, and I think that this is not going to change until the end of this year and possibly even in the first meeting of the new board. Because like I said, a credibility is something that you, you need, it's costly. So you, you actually sometimes, uh, I mean, the, there's vast literature on it. Uh, maybe the central bank in Brazil needs to be a, a little more restrictive than a similar central bank in a more mature economy would have to do to tackle the same uh, inflation level, because there is a risk premia of this kind of interference that you probably wouldn't be having, for instance, over the ECB or the BOJ in Japan, the BOE in England you probably have a less. So uh, there is a premium that you need to pay. And that's what mostly would be driving a hike at this moment, especially mm -hmm. the market has improved so much from the last meeting until now that it's not out of the realm of possibility that they just don't need to hike anymore because they, they, the, the new hawkish stance is enough to improve on the expectations. But then again, if the expectations and the dollar are improving, because that people actually think that you, you will deliver, it's a price that you need to pay. And mm -hmm. that's why I say it's easy to lose. If you do a mistake, if you make a mistake, it's easy to lose. Maybe, for instance, when the central bank, uh, Campos Neto, cuts the rates for, uh, at 2% and meet the pandemic, okay, it was the pandemic, it, nobody had ever, as certain of anything. But uh, as soon as they did, they went so far below the the what you call like the the neutral rate which is basically what's the neutral rate is the is the rate level in which you're not stimulating the economy and you're not uh restricting it so it's a net level that supposedly inflation will remain constant if you keep the rates at that level uh so when you when, when they when sometimes you will go below that because inflation is you're running the risk of deflation which is also bad for the economy so you need to stimulate and then sometimes then you go restrictive because you you actually need to cool down the economy so uh, in in a sense maybe Brazil didn't need to go into that hiking cycle up up to thirteen maybe a different central bank could have ended at ten but. That is the cost of credibility, uh, and that's something that they really need to be taken into consideration when they decide. There's more to it than just 
uh, like I said, I mean, sometimes you know the data is the same, but you really need to weigh a lot of situations. Which, uh, when you 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 have the established this credibility, you can easily um, change pace and start easy, and people wouldn't be concerned because people would say, "Hey, I know that if they need to revert, they will." So I think that's a a, a, a question that's going to be lingering up until the beginning of the next year with the new board and the new board if the new board keep doing keep doing the same type of approach and a cohesive approach i think it's going to do wonders for the credibility and before i let you go speaking of the new board uh probably one of the worst kept secrets in brasilia is the fact that the government is bullish on gabriel galipolo who is already the central bank's monetary policy director. Many saw his nomination as a stepping stone to becoming the next chairman of the central bank, and the announcement is expected for the next few days or weeks. Um, how do you see, uh, I mean, what do you expect from Gabriel Galipolo? Who kind of, which kind of economist is he, and which kind of guidance do you think he'll bring to the central bank? Uh, I mean, uh, there there were a lot of concerns regarding him uh, in the market. First of all, because he comes from a more of a heterodox uh, background uh, in terms of uh, the types of eco economists and economics that he would be uh, defending. But he is a market guy. He comes from the market. He was at Banco, uh, in Banco Fibra. Or bank factor. Uh, I mean, he 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 comes from the market. He knows how this market op operates. Even if he has, I would say that I mean, given given the same type of data, he tends to have a a more of a dovish leaning. But like I said, that's not really a problem if you're actually doing the things uh, correctly. And I think mm -hmm. at some now markets uh, are starting to come around to the fact that he he is is not the dream scenario, but he is okay. And I think as soon as he is, and this is not, I mean, this is a strategy that the current board is doing, making him being the face of this new hawkish uh, message. I think that is pretty clever because I mean, if they, this is a guy that's going to run the board, and. Uh, not only the the president of the central bank is the 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 casts the the siding vote in a split decision uh there is a, a a persuasion i mean they will say that every board member is independent uh, amongst themselves so they only answer to their own uh, minds when they take a decision but that's not what historically has happened i mean the central bank president has a way especially over the more technical bureaucrat uh, board members. So it's going to be really important if he's the barrier of this more hawkish message, if he's the guy, the face of the, 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 the board, that's going to be buying the credibility that I said. So I, I think that Gallipolo is, 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 pro, is it's, it's going to be good for the markets when we, we look ahead. Uh, maybe some uh, questions over his commitment will still happen until they deliver one final uh, hike. But I think like this is the the this is the uh, he he is going to be the the he's going to win over markets. Uh, I I have no 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 doubt about it. I think he uh, especially. When it all comes to shove, you know, when push comes to show, the incentives to become the be, before becoming the president are one, but after you get to that position, you have less incentive to actually be winking to the government, because I mean, as you mentioned, it's very hard to remove a central bank board member. So it's uh, you have an incentive to please them before you get the nomination. Afterwards, you can have a more in the uh, bigger independence, and also the government knows this. The government knows that they will no, try. And also, if I, if I may add something, he was the deputy for finance minister 
Fernando Correct. Haddad. Fernando Correct. Haddad was something that the markets uh, cringed about. They 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 abhorred the idea of Fernando Haddad being the finance exactly. minister. And months into the Lula administration, they had come around and actually improved and recognized that actually one of the few defenders of fiscal austerity, exactly. maybe the, the lone ranger for fiscal austerity in the Lula administration is Fernando Haddad. Uh, I would say that there's always there. Uh, I mean, the market has a, an ideological bias. I mean, it's stronger in Brazil than it is uh, the foreigners when they look to Brazil. It has a, 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 an ideological bias, which you can clearly say it's right-leaning. I'm not saying far right-leaning. <laughs> Uh, but it's a it's a right leaning bias, a more orthodox type of economic view that's usually prevalent in the right rather than in the left. But at the same time, you know, uh, I think the bar for the government to act is actually not that high, especially among the foreigners. I think if the foreigners see that there's uh, at least hints of uh, orthodoxy in the way that they tackle the economic issues, if they actually w are working into improving fiscal accounts, and if they are uh, uh, able to actually deliver on, on, on uh, monetary policy hikes if they need to, I think the bar is actually not that high. I think Brazil can be poised to gain uh, with with uh, maybe not uh, as much as they would if if in the same scenario was a center right president i think it would be easier for them to to actually uh get get this this good in the goodwill at the same time i think it's not like uh, investors especially global investors are looking at brazil as a as a nightmare i think they are pretty happy with just some 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 levels of economic uh, prowess, and I think what Adaj gained the market, uh, Nagalipolo will do also if they keep on this trajectory. Mario Sergio, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Always a pleasure. Mário Sérgio Lima is a senior Brazil analyst at Medley Global Advisors. Um, my name is Gustavo Ribeiro, Editor-in-Chief of the Brazilian Report, and if you like explaining Brazil, please rate us with a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts, because that will help us reach a broader audience, or better yet, you can support our journalism by subscribing to the Brazilian Report, which is the journalistic engine behind this podcast. You can go to brazilian.report slash subscribe and help fuel our journalism, because your support keep us growing. And because we have so loyal uh, subscribers, we have been able to carry out very important investigations. And we have recently been named the best news website in the Americas for a small or local newsroom by the World Association of News Publishers. So please subscribe to the Brazilian Report, or you can go to our buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report platform and pledge your support uh, for our journalism. Thank you very much. Explaining Brazil will be back next week. <music>